as now we are continuing our series on Joshua and his leadership, both his strengths and his weaknesses, his uh, great uh, victories, and sometimes his failings. And it's one thing I like about the Word of God is it presents people, even our heroes, as normal people. And we see them both in their strength and in their weaknesses and how that God can work through both. And I'm so glad that God can do that. And I'm glad, so glad that God can take my weaknesses and turn them to, to his strengths. As Paul said, my, his strengths are made perfect in our weakness. And so we see that uh, even in the mistakes that Joshua made, we see that God was able to bless Israel because in all, Joshua was a man who followed the Lord. But in chapter 9, we see, and it came to pass, when all the kings were on this side of the Jordan, so the writer obviously is not Moses because he was on the other side of the Jordan. He never got to go uh, on the west side, um, to the West Bank. So whoever the writer is here is, uh, has, is a native of the promised land. In the hills and in the lowland and in all the coast of, uh, the, great, uh, of, um, of the Great Sea toward Lebanon, so that's the Mediterranean, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusites heard about it, that, the, that they gathered together to fight Joshua and Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jer Jericho and to Ai, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys and old wine skins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on, their, on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua, to the camp of Gilgal, and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you dwell among us, so how can we make a covenant with you? Then they said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you, and where do you come from? And they said, From a very far country your servants have come because of the name of your, the Lord your God. For we have heard of his name, of his fame, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did the two, to the two kings of Amorites who were uh, beyond the Jordan, to Sion and to uh, the king of Heshbon, and Og the, uh, of Bashan, who was at Asheroth. Um, Therefore, all the elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you and for the journey, and meet them, and say to them, We are your servants, now therefore make a covenant with us. There, this bread of ours, we took hot for our provision from our houses of the day, on the day of our uh, departed, that we departed to come to you. But now look, it is dry and moldy, and these wineskins which we filled were new, and see they were torn, and these of our garments and our sandals have become old because of our very long journey. Then the men of Israel took some of the provisions but they did not seek or did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let, let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. And it happened on the day, uh, uh, three days, that after they had made a covenant with them, that they heard that they were of the neighbors dwelt near them. Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to the cities on the third day. Now the cities were, were Gibeon and Shepharah and Beroth and kareth -Sherim. But the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation complained against the rulers. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your word this morning or this evening. How we pray, Lord, that uh, you would, uh, as we walk with you in the light of your word, that even though sometimes, Lord, we, we forget to do the very things you tell us, 
And that is, we make decisions without conferring with you. In all our ways, we don't uh, seek your will. And as a result, you can't direct our paths, or you won't. And yet, Lord, you do bless in spite of our mistakes. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, there's so many times in our lives where you have very graciously waited on us to come back to you, and you have to straighten out the messes that we make. But, oh, Father, we pray that you would help us to walk in the light of your word, in the light of what you tell us, the decisions we make. Oh, how we pray, whether they're great or small, may we make them in your will. So thank you again, Lord, for your word, what you teach us through it. Use us, Lord, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we see in the, these verses that uh, Joshua now, they've come off the, the uh, uh, after the, excuse me, that usually doesn't bother me, but today I'm going to get a shotgun. No, <laughs> next time it is, I'll throw a songbook at it. No, I won't. <laughs> but... Um, uh, Joshua now has come off the great victories at Ai and, of course, of Jericho. And, uh, but we see again that he did not, two times in a row, that he did not consult the Lord before he made his next step. And we see here again, back in verse, as we looked at, they did not consent with the Lord before they made this covenant. Now, what had happened, that these people, the, 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 actually there was a confederation, and we saw in the chapters 1 through, one and two, verses 1 and 2, that uh, there was a, a group of city-states right around each other, kind of like uh, little suburbs or whatever of each other, and with the main, uh, main city being uh, the Gib uh, Gibeon. And it was right in the center, that central valley that uh, went right across to the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And on the, on the west, uh, on, on the left would be, uh, or excuse me, to the south would be what would later on become Judah, and to the north would be the uh, other ten tribes that would be to the north. Now, that was a very central and very uh, uh, strategic location because it opened up the pathways to both Jerusalem, uh, which you would go on to what would later on become Bethany and, uh, so, and so forth as you would go down to Jerusalem, but also it went up to Galilee. And so and to the plains of Megiddo, which would be the, um, uh, which would be the valley of, of Armageddon. And so it was, a, it was a, just a natural route across there. And these people were in very strategic location. And you notice that all the rest of these tribes, many of them had said, oh, what we have listened in chapters one and uh, verses one and two. And it said that, um, they, that the Amorites and the Hittites, uh, all of a sudden now they're not going to be fighting one city at a time. But now these people were now confederating. They're coming together and they said, we're going to fight them together. And so you can imagine what it must have been like with uh, Joshua saying, oh my, it's one thing to take a city. Now it's, it's going to be much more difficult to take several armies at one time. And so, but then there, we see in the middle of all this that we have these Gibeonites. And they were only about 25 miles away from where Joshua and the people were camped out at, uh, as we see that uh, that they had come to him, the Gibeonites and so forth, and they came over to the camp at Gilgal, Gal, which they had crossed over, and that would be just south of uh, Jericho. And so about 25 miles inland from there was that strategic series of cities. And these people, to their credit, and this is what, you know, I, it's interesting, we talked about it uh, at lunch today, but... Uh, just how deep the Bible is and things, how that you can read it one way and you don't see it until you read it another. And there's two, you know, we look at this and we, and so many times this is Joshua's failing. I mean, these people, you know, they deceived him and so forth, but they did exactly what, uh, what we see that, uh, that Rahab the harlot done. They had heard about Remember, remember what we just read? They, they had heard about uh, Egypt. And this, you just don't destroy the strongest army in the world and not know about it. And so that went on. That was 40 years ago. That would be like 1984 for us, you know, that they had heard about it. And they didn't forget it. It would be like the Challenger. If you were alive at that time, you would still remember it. It was back in those, those days or whatever else. 
the Reagan era, whatever. But uh, so people still remembered that. And it was passed on that these people, they're out there roaming around in the desert and so forth. What are they doing? But whatever they do, they win. And the, the great city or the great kings of Sion and Og, those were the two of the strongest kings on the east side of the Jordan. And they whipped them. And so what are we going to do? And then Jericho, my, oh, my. And the, what are we going to do with the, they, they tore up the, the strongest city that we have in this whole area. So what do we do? And so we see in their light, in the way that they are coming across, we see that uh, they made a very bold decision. And that they, they said, we will throw ourselves at their mercy. And that was, and that was something that I think, you know, I've asked many times, why does the devil's crowd not give up? Why does the, the devil give up? Because they're blinded. But those who really think about the things of the Lord, uh, like Rahab did, and now like the Gibeonites, they say, listen, their God is strong. Their God, obviously, is bigger than our God. Now, they were still had all the culture and all the, the problems that any sinful person had, and uh, those who get into the Greek or into the Hebrew language say that the Hivite, these were Hivites that were on the list to be destroyed. Um, the very word comes from the word meaning snake. Or they, were, they were very crafty people. And so that was their lifestyle. And yet they saw, whenever they saw the, 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 the people of the Lord, they realized that uh, they better submit to him. And so we see that, uh, that they were wise compared to the other people that uh, were going to come up against them. And yet we see that it says that, and when the inhabitants of Gibeon, notice in verse 3, heard that Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they worked craftily and, and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks and they dressed up like a bunch of old people. And they put on, and they took them some um, old, and the word moldy there is probably crumbly bread. I mean, just as getting hard and brittle, they wouldn't be eating. In fact, the, later on we see that uh, some of the children or some of the leaders of Israel ate the, some of the bread with them as a sign of the covenant, and uh, they wouldn't eat moldy bread. They probably ate very crumbly old bread. But uh, we see that uh, they brought all the, and they, they dressed up as if they had come from 100 miles away. And notice that they didn't say anything about Jericho or Ai. They mentioned Sion and Og because that would have given it away that they had heard about that just a few days before. And so they mentioned the king Sion and Og and the kings of Egypt and, of course, the Red Sea Crossing and so forth. But they didn't mention anything that had happened uh, uh, nearby or uh, just a few days before. And so they were coming and they really put on a good act. And uh, notice it says that um, in verse 6, we have come from a far country, and therefore make a covenant with us. Then the men of Israel said to them, Hivites, uh, to the Hivites, uh, perhaps you dwell among us. So how can we make a covenant with you? They were suspicious. And they were wondering, why did these people come all the way? If, we don't, if we've never heard of them, why, did, why are they coming and now trying to make a covenant with us. We're not even close to them if they're from a far country. And where are they from in the first place? And so they were a little skeptical of what's going on. And Joshua said, who are you? And where do you come from? Now, here's the key verse. So they said, from a very far country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. That's the key to the whole chapter. Because of the name of the Lord your God. Now, we've studied that, uh, that uh, subject of the name of God, the name of the Lord. When you, uh, when you uh, call upon the name of the Lord, you're calling upon the God of heaven and all of his attributes, all of his power. You're looking at him as his reputation. I mean, it's his, it's, it's his being. And, of course, there's no other name in, above the name of the Lord Jesus. And so he puts a lot, uh, well, he puts premium value, value in his name. And he honors his name and his word more than anything else. 
And so they knew about the character and the power, and they, many, they must have heard a lot about even some of, the, uh, some of the culture that the children of Israel had. And so they were saying, we, came, we heard because of the name of the Lord your God, for we have heard of his fame. Fame and name were almost, well, like their homonyms here, uh, but uh, they were synonymous in uh, Hebrew language. In other words, if you had fame, you had a name. If you had name, you had fame. In other words, it was the character of who you were. And, um, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings, notice they, they omitted the king of, uh, of Jericho um, and of Ai. Therefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us and said, Come. So we are coming because of what we heard about your God. And we want to submit to your God. We want, we want to submit to you because you serve your God. And so we'll serve you because you serve your God. And so they're surrendering. Now, this was something. Now, earlier, the Lord had said to, Josh, to, uh, to Moses that uh, if anyone would, then they could become servants. But this was... Uh, but it was more on an individual basis. But here you have a whole situation of a, of a group of people that are deceived through deception. You know, it's interesting how many times people come to God. Uh, they'll come to a church service or uh, they will come because they're going to think they're going to get something out, out of it, like materially, and yet God speaks to them spiritually. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, we call those hooks. Sometimes, you know, the Lord fed the 5,000 before he preached to them. And so there's, but at the same time, there are, I like what uh, Warren Rearsby calls him. He says uh, in his ministry, and that's true in all of ours, uh, there are the seekers and the sneakers. The seekers that come to church and they, they represent, you know, people that really are seeking God. And then you have the sneakers and they are the ones who come because they're trying to get something out of the church or out of the congregation. And, you know, very rarely do I have anybody that comes in to ask us for something that's not a Christian and how they want to serve God, but they've fallen on hard times. But, you know, so it's one of those things where um, we want to help people, but at the same time, you know, we, we, we don't want to be taken advantage of other than what we are willing to, to do for people. We know that's an advantage. But, but here we see that these people are coming as sneakers. They're wanting to get out of it. And yet, and the result, even with that, God worked through their, the, even through their culture because they were snakes in the grass, as the word Hevite even means, a very sneaky type of people. And yet God used that very thing to, to allow them to become part of the children of Israel. We'll see this in a moment. Or see that uh, they were protected and how they become part, they became great servants of the Lord. And so we see that... Um, the, they, because they heard the name of the Lord. What do people hear from us? What do they think whenever they hear that we follow the Lord and his name is upheld here? Oh, that they would see the Lord. They, they would see his power. They would, they would see that we're different, that uh, God does different things through us in different ways. Oh, that we don't destroy armies or whatever else, but uh, that we do. Uh, see God work through answered prayer, that God answers and meets the needs of our people, and that we can be joyful even in the, in the, in spite, in the face of danger. And so we see now that these people are coming even under false pretenses. And we see now the, the other key verse, as we see here, is they brought all the wineskins and all this, but notice in verse 14, then the men of Israel took some of their provisions but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So those are the two key passages in the Bible. First of all, we saw your name, but then we see that uh, in verse 14, Joshua, just like they didn't at, at Ai, so now two times in a row, they did not seek counsel of the Lord. And so, I, but I turn this around and say, what if they had? What if they had sought the Lord? And of course, we know that uh, God had given, it's a mysterious thing, we don't quite understand it with the priest, but whenever the king or the leader, like Moses or Joshua, they could go to the priest and there was what was called the Urim and the Thummim. 
And there was a way of discerning the will of the God through that procedure that they, would, that they had. But we don't see Joshua doing that either in Ai, and we don't see him doing it here. But what would God have done if they had? Because these people are recognizing the name of the Lord. I wonder what, uh, how that it would have been any different. They, and we see that they're seeking the Lord and, because they've heard the same thing that Rahab had heard. Now, Rahab was not perfect either. Remember, she lied and let the, the uh, and she lied to their king about what the hell, she let them out of, uh, um, and when she let them out of the window and so forth. So these people were very crafty people. They were, they didn't, didn't know a whole lot about virtue of, of telling the truth as we, uh, archaeologists tell us that, that they were some of the most uh, immoral people uh, in the world. Uh, I, another th- uh, something that maybe I need to talk about to Rob again, I'll just show you uh, some of the things uh, that archaeologists have found of just how wicked these people were and totally, horribly immoral. And so this was their background. And they didn't, I mean, all they knew how to do was lie, you know, or, and get what they wanted out through subterfuge. And yet uh, God was willing, was, took them just as they are and brought them into uh, his protectorate, even though they were imperfect. Aren't you glad that God, whenever you were saved, didn't, uh, I mean, he took you even though you were totally imperfect. Can you imagine being that thief on the cross. He was still a thief whenever he died, wasn't he? Uh, when he got to heaven, you can imagine, uh, why are you here? Well, there was Jesus. He was on the cross, and he told me that, you know, I'd be here. Well, why, why are you here? Because all I know, you can imagine what it must have been like to be the thief on the cross the day he died. I mean, he was still just, we still would know, when we get to heaven, how are we going to know him? We don't even know his name. His name will be, the thief on the cross to us, right? And yet God saved him. And so it is with so many times, it's not that you're perfect, but that you realize who God is and you come to him. And so these are what these people are doing. And it would have been interesting to see what would have happened if they had been like Rahab, who became part of the very line of the Lord Jesus, ancestry of the Lord Jesus, how much more elevated status they would have had than servants, just servants of the Lord. But we'll see how that God used that. But here we see that they come, and uh, that, um, and it happened on the, thir- the, the, the um, third day uh, that they made a covenant. Now, once a covenant is made, God expects you to keep it. A covenant is not a contract. A contract is if you break it, I break it. A covenant is unconditional. God's covenant with us is that if you'll come to me, I will in no wise what? Cast you out. And so we could be, that's the reason I don't know when someone who has been a member of the church for years and then falls off the cliff spiritually, I can't tell you they're on their way to hell because I have to leave that to the Lord because of his covenant. He will tell me when I get to heaven whether they were saved in the first place or not, but I can't because those are the covenants that God makes with his people. But we see now that they, they made this covenant. And even, uh, I like what uh, we've looked at uh, Psalms. Psalm 15.4 says that God, happy is the man who, sw- who swears to his own hurt. In other words, he makes, his, he makes the covenant. And even though it turns out that it wasn't in his favor, he still fulfills his promise because he made it. Now, that's what God expects us to do. If we make a promise then unless the other person lets us out of it, we need to fulfill that promise. That's one of the things as a pastor or as a father, I had to be careful. My wife would remind me, you told them you'd do this if you'd do so. Oh my, did I tell say that? Yes, you did. Oh boy. And so, you know, um, any of you parents ever have that problem? Us dads would usually forget and our wives would remind, remind us, right? But uh, there again, that was one of the things that... Uh, our kids need to see is that we, if we make a promise, I'll keep it. And I, I've told you the story about Danielle and her clarinet and how that uh, I just told her that, uh, oh, if the money comes in, we'll get it. And the money came in, and boy, I had all kinds of plans for that money, but she reminded me. And I wound up out of a $500 gift that I got, I wound up with $50. You know, but she got the rest of it because 
I promised it to her, but boy, did she tell me. And then her mother let me know, you know, that, but that was a real blessing to her. And even to this day, it's something that God answers prayer to a nine-year-old girl. Isn't it important that nine-year-old girls know that prayers are answered? Or boys or whatever else. So we see that uh, uh, I swore to my own hurt after being reminded, of course, but to their kids, sometimes we have to be reminded. But uh, we're all fallible people. But uh, so this is what Joshua now, he says, okay, oh boy, we've made this covenant. Now what do we do about it? And his notice it happened on the end of the day. They made this covenant. They ate with one another. That's one of the things that you go back to Laban and, jo um, Laban and Jacob and others. Whenever they, you made that covenant, you'd have a little feast together. They swapped bread with one another. Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to the cities on the third day. And their cities, and he names them Gibeon and Cheveth and uh, Bereth and kareth -Jerim. But the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. And my folks, if you take, if you so, so help me God, then you better fulfill that promise or that oath. But they swore by the, the Lord God of Israel and all the congregation complained. Oh man, like, look at these cities. Look what we could have had. Look at the loot that we could have gotten out of these cities. Hey, I was nothing compared to these uh, group of cities. And then all the rulers, they got together, Monday morning quarterbacks, and we have sworn to them, and to, uh, to um, Israel in verse 19, by the Lord God of Israel, now therefore we may not touch them. So they knew uh, the consequences. Later on, we see that there was a king of Israel who violated that con that. Uh, that covenant that God had made. Saul had come after, if you remember in sec, uh, Samuel chapter 21, it says that there was a big drought and a big famine in the land of Israel. And David had treated of the Lord, probably through the Urim and Cumin, we don't know. But uh, he said, what's going on, Lord? And the Lord said, because what Saul had done to the Gibeonites, if you remember. And that covenant was made. And God cursed Israel because what Saul had done to the Gibeonites and David had to correct it because that was a covenant that God had made with, the, with these people. And so they realized that uh, it was wrong um, or that they couldn't break this covenant. Uh, this, will, uh, th this we will do to them. Uh, we will let them live lest the wrath of God be upon us. So they were between a rock and a hard place. How do we let these people live when God told us to kill them, but now that we've told, let them live, now uh, what can we do with them? And he says, uh, because of the oath which we swore to them, and the ruler said, let them live, but let them be wood choppers, wood cutters, and water carriers for the congregation as the rulers had promised them. Now, what we see happened was actually they became, because this, this group of cities was close to Gilgal and then later on Shiloh and Shechem, or these places where the, where the, um, where the ark would be uh, located for several years, many decades, we see that they became uh, servants of the Lord there, and they were the ones who carried the water for all the sacrifices. They were the ones who carried the wood and for the burnt offerings and so forth. They became the major servants for these huge feasts that they would have where thousands of animals would be killed. These were the people that would, would do the dirty work and do the, hard, the, uh, the water carrying and so forth. And so we see that they willingly did it. We never see anything about the Gibeonites, and that would be uh, the collective group of cities here. We never see anything where they, were the, where they led the children of Israel into idolatry. In fact, we see just the opposite. We see them becoming very loyal to the nation of Israel. And we see both in Ezra and Nehemiah and even First Chronicles how that the children, that they were later on, they were called the, the Nethanim. And it was, uh, uh, it was, and that was called the, um, the given ones or the givers. And so these people got to be known as givers or people that were servants of the Lord. And 
we see that uh, Ezra tells us in chapter 2, verse 43, that 500 of them came back from Babylon. So they, notice, they were willingly, they willingly went into captivity with the children of Israel. They identified with the children of Israel and they came back and guess what they did when they got back, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, when they rebuilt the temple? They went back to serving. They found out the service of the servants, it's better to be a servant of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the, of the, of the wicked. And so they willingly became the servant class. And they said, my, this is best, you know, serving the Lord and being around that temple is better than anything else on earth. And so how that God was able to bless those people in spite of how they came to, to him originally. And so we see that Joshua called him in verse uh, 22 uh, and spoke to them saying, why have you deceived us? And he goes on, now therefore uh, you are cursed that curse turned into a blessing. That's another one of those where, like with Simeon and Levi, where they were cursed, and yet Levi's curse turned into a blessing because they became the tribe of Levi, the priestly class, some of the great men, including Moses and Zechariah and others that came from that tribe, the, the curse that was turned to blessing. And here we have another time where they're cursed, and yet it turns to blessing because they turn to the Lord. And so we see that now therefore you're cursed and none of you shall be freed from being slaves. <laughs> it's interesting. One time in the history where we see they became slaves and loved it. It's just amazing how that God used them. So they answered Joshua and said, because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land. No, they knew all that. We knew, we heard about that. And that God had given you all the land to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Therefore, we were very much afraid for our lives because of you and have, uh, and have done this thing. Uh, and now uh, here we are in your hands. Do with us as seems good and right to you. Unconditional surrender. Isn't that what we have to do when we come to the Lord? It's totally unconditional surrender just as we are without one plea so whatever you want we submit to the lord your god and to you uh, and so we see so he did to them and delivered them out of the land of the children uh, children of israel so they did not kill them and that day joshua made them wood choppers wood cutters and water carriers for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord in the place which he would choose. Now that term, the place he would choose, we saw in Deuteronomy was used 20 times because that uh, tabernacle would move around. But uh, he said, wherever that tabernacle is, is my presence. And here we see that it was going to be right in the region for many years before the temple was built in the region where the Gibeonites were. And so, actually, they didn't have to go far from home to be servants of the Lord. And even going down to Jerusalem wasn't that far away. But God, they became willing servants of the Lord in the place, even to this day. Again, we see that uh, this writer was not Moses. It had to be somebody on the west side of the Jordan and uh, after the time of Joshua. And so, we see that God uses people in different ways. And how that people come to the Lord... Many times can be even deceptive, but God has a way of straightening out the mind, doesn't he? Many people will say, oh my, I want salvation because I want what they have. And yet God can save them and they get a lot more than they ever bargained for. But turn with me over to 2 Kings chapter 8. And we'll see that, um, or excuse me, this is 1 Kings chapter 8. And this is the very design that God had set up for the, uh, for the temple. And as this great prayer and dedication that we have of, Josh, of, uh, of Solomon at the temple. Let's see now. I want to make sure that I got the verses right. Um, verses, I got Chronicles. No wonder I was in the wrong place. Okay. Um, first Chronicles, uh, first, I'm sorry. Second Kings chapter 8. 2 Kings chapter 8, in verses 41 and 40 to 43. Let's see if I can. Uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, First Kings chapter. I'm so mixed up. A lot of distractions tonight. But <laughs> okay, First um, Kings chapter uh, eight, verse forty-one. Now here we're talking Solomon's prayer and dedication of the temple. Moreover, concerning a foreigner, that'd be the, like the Gibeonites, who is not of your people, Israel but has come from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm. And when he comes and prays toward the temple, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you and do your people uh, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by my name. There's the name of the Lord. And so God extends his hand and his saving arm to anyone who will call upon his name, no matter where they're coming from, and by you know, how they're first attracted to it. But God has a way of straightening out their minds, and God has a way of straightening out their hearts. And oh my, I didn't, I'm so glad that whenever I was saved, I didn't have to know everything about God. All I knew is I needed Him. And uh, I didn't knew, know half the things that were wrong with me. I just came to Him the way I was, from my background, with the best way I knew how. And I asked the Lord to save me. How about you? And it wasn't because of any great works I had done. It wasn't because all of a sudden I saw the light and I, all of a sudden I was perfect and I was so wise. No, God saved me in, in spite of me being a foolish person. Did you not you? Aren't you glad that God will save whosoever will may come? And so when we deal with people, we don't have to straighten them out first. As long as they're seeking God, let's seek God with them and see what God can do in their lives. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord and we heard of his name and we want what you have. And God bless those people in spite of the mistakes of what Joshua had done. They became servants of the Lord. And so can we. Now, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for in spite of hell, mixed up and foolish we were and are. Yet when we come to you, you have ways of straightening us out. You have ways of, of turning on the light in our minds. You have ways of taking our old sin-cursed bodies and using them for your glory. Lord, may we be willing to be woodchoppers for you. May we be willing to do whatever you call us to do in your service. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.